This is my code is broken. Very first interview attempt. Do you feel honored? I feel honored. My code is broken. My code is broken. From Huntsville, Alabama, you are listening to My Code is Broken, a podcast by developers for everybody. Here is your host, Dan Nagel. My code is broken. My code is broken. Hello. Thank you for downloading the inaugural episode. I'm Dan Nagel. Each episode is divided into two parts, an interview and an essay. In today's essay, I complain about bad language names. Stay tuned after the interview to hear it. You can post comments on this episode at mycodeisbroken.com. You can also talk to me on Twitter at NagelCode. My guest today is Chris Beeman, a developer, an entrepreneur, and community advocate. Since landing in Huntsville only eight months ago, he has already been mentioned in print, on the radio, and is a young professional finalist. When Chris is not working his day job, he is working on side projects. How many side projects do you have at any given moment? Probably have about eight right now. Eight side projects? Yeah. Now, are these writing code or management or... Some of them are writing code, some of them are management, um, some of them are community organizing. Most of them are in the vein of either entrepreneurship or trying to nurture or facilitate entrepreneurship in Huntsville. Is the motivation for all these side projects hoping that, like an investor investing in small things, hoping one of them takes off so you can retire early, or is this just because you have some innate desire that you just can't stop working. It's much more the latter. All of my side projects thus far are non-monetized and there really isn't a business motive. Some would say that there should be. Um, I work very hard for no money. Chris recently released one of his side projects. It is a direct relisting of freelance professionals called Open Huntsville. I had this idea for this thing that should exist, and I posted in the Huntsville Open Tech Coffee Facebook group and said, hey, I've heard from a bunch of people that this is something that should exist in Huntsville and that people would find useful. What do people think? And a bunch of people commented in that thread and said, yes, we want this, or yes, if you make this, I'd like to have a profile. Um, and the plan was with my limited development knowledge was to use WordPress as a CMS and basically build a WordPress theme and make it so that anyone could create a WordPress account and post their profile. Instead you went with Ruby, Pacquiao, Postgres, Heroku, is that right? Right, so I started talking about wanting to do this project and a few people expressed interest in getting involved. And at the time, I didn't see it. I didn't see the the vision for the product. So it was just a you know a small community project that I was willing to collaborate with anyone on. And it just so happened that our team wound up being very synergistic and working well together. But Kyle Newman expressed interest, Tara Anzalone, Joe McKenzie, and we each sort of assumed roles in the project. And Kyle had the idea to build the back end in Pacquiao as opposed to WordPress. Right. And wanting to build a Huntsville based for and by Huntsville project, we really liked the idea of supporting Pacquiao. And so it was a good project for everybody. Right, and Pacquiao was invented here in Huntsville. Correct. Yeah, Pacquiao so was invented here in Huntsville, so it's a homegrown, homegrown initiative. So the entire project's open source? The entire project's open source and all of our GitHub issues are public, and we've sized all of our tasks inside Waffle, and we use Wonderlist as a general task management application for everything, marketing, design, branding, that kind of stuff. And then all of our dev-specific stuff is in Waffle. Open Huntsville is now live. What better way to celebrate than an after-hours party at the Apple Store? What? That never crossed your mind? I want to 
know about this open Huntsville launch party that happened at the Apple store because I didn't even know that Apple had launch parties. It's actually unprecedented. I think that we're the first group possibly ever that's run a private after hours party at an Apple store anywhere. Really? Yes. Out of all the Apple stores? Out of all the Apple stores. To your knowledge. To my knowledge. So, Apple closed at their normal hours, what was it, 7 o'clock? Yes. And then they let you in for additional, how long? Two hours. For two hours, just to have a party in their store celebrating Open Huntsville. Correct. Can you tell us how that happened? Yeah, it's actually a really interesting story. So, two members of our Open Huntsville team, Andrew and Joe, both used to work at the Apple Store, and we were at Bridge Street one day after a meeting at Cafe 153, and we went by the Apple Store just to chit-chat with coworkers and friends of theirs, and we were, you know, just sort of brainstorming with these people, thinking out loud, saying, wouldn't it be cool if we could have a party here at the Apple Store? And the <laughs> Apple Store employees responded to say, actually, you could. That sounds like a good idea. And... We said, really? And they said, yeah. And so we went and talked to the manager on duty and said, we just want to get this straight. You think we could have you know, a private party here at the Apple Store? We're making this website, and we want to have a launch party. And they said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea. It would be a good way for us to tell our business services and for you to bring people to a cool location. Do you think, I mean, do they have sales going on at the same time or they didn't have sales going on at the same time so do you think maybe they got some just additional marketing and goodwill out of this i think they got tremendous marketing and a big community pat on the back for doing this so the the store management said thumbs up we think it's a great idea bring a bunch of people here and have a party after hours we picked a date after that day we went back and forth with management a couple times to solidify a date but set the wheels in motion, started buying supplies, made an event page on Facebook, started inviting people, and then about five days before the event officially launched, I got a phone call from the business manager at the store who said, hey, really sorry to do this, but it turns out that the way that you've marketed and branded the event and the language that you've used and Apple's policies on the matter align in the way that we would need to cancel this event and, oh, no. and or postpone it until we can do it in a new way where we use new language. Apple, being the most protective brand in the world of their brand, right. is petrified of endorsing a brand in a way that they wouldn't want to. And, and so we need to revisit this. And I said... Oh my gosh, I'm really <laughs> disappointed to hear this. I would really like to try and work things out. We've already invited tons of people. The people who said they would come would be devastated to hear that this isn't happening. Can we please work things out? And they said, no, I'm really sorry, we can't. And I said, can I please talk to your manager and escalate it up the chain to someone else who I could try and convince of doing this? And so I was connected with a regional manager for Apple, from Apple Corporate, and explained the situation over a conference call and touted... So uh, you had a conference call with Apple in California? I had a conference call with Apple in Nashville. In Nashville? Yes. So, so it goes from here, the regional is Nashville. To Nashville. Okay. And, you know, probably to some other regional place before getting to California. But I had a conference call with two, two gentlemen who work for Apple Corporate who are experts in Apple branding and and that kind of thing, and basically sold them on the idea that Apple needs to support community projects like this. This is good business development for Apple, and our guests would be upset if they didn't get to come to this event, and it would hurt Apple if hey, they what, canceled. So what my theory based on what you just said, is perhaps that they didn't want to do this, but the fact that they said they would, if they were to cancel now, it'd look worse. Right. So you think that's probably what happened? I think that's part of it. However, they communicated, these, these gentlemen communicated that they really wanted to do this and that they themselves personally thought that 
you know, us being nonprofit and us building a community resource and this being about connecting the business community was really cool and they wanted to support it. The fact that you're a bunch of volunteers not getting paid launching this is what helped sell it. It did. And also that it was focused around business and Apple has a number of enterprise support and business, you know, small business support services. So Apple saw that as an opportunity to co-brand or, or co-market you know, market their own services and products. And I tried to frame that conversation with these people in that way, that it was really a business opportunity for them. And how, long of a, how long did the conversation go with you trying to convince them? The conversation, conversation was about half an hour. Okay. Well, you convinced pretty quickly. It was pretty quickly, and I know they talked to corporate, and eventually we got the thumbs up. And then once we got the thumbs up, Apple at a lower level was really supportive of the event and furthermore agreed that it was a great opportunity for Apple. And to that extent, they started putting resources into place to help facilitate the event. So, oh, okay. So they, you had buy-in. Yeah, we had buy-in. They closed the store early. They staffed the event. Their their employees stayed at the event for another hour after the event ended. So they they were, I assume that their employees were paid from 6 p.m. when the store closed all the way through 10 p.m. when they finished cleanup. They purchased food for the event. They had oh, an, nice. They had an Apple employee work the door who signed people in and gave people gave people name tags. They they had Apple employees facilitating collaboration at the event. And then they collected all our trash, they cleaned up the store afterwards, and they closed down the store after having had over 100 people in their store after hours eating food and drinking. So, I mean, really, they did a phenomenal that, job. That's yeah. very impressive. Really impressive on Apple's part. I, it, I was wondering where the, the food came from because, I mean, I thought... I guess you just opened, we, we, you opened up your wallet and yeah we we all opened our wallets and bought a couple hundred dollars worth of food but Apple also put in money on food okay that's do you think they'll do this again and they're willing to do this again okay and we're talking to them I talked to them an hour or so ago about doing this again do you think this type of event for Apple might spread to other stores I do think so I think we set a precedent that is really viable. And it's just not every day that someone comes to you and says, hi, can I throw a party in your house? In the case of Apple, where they're trying to reach customers, this is a new way to reach customers and to position their brand in a fun, new community way that you know really could extend to every Apple store everywhere. I would just, based on the, the numbers that probably half to three quarters of those people in the store may have had Android phones. Do you think it's possible because they saw this goodwill gesture from Apple, they may buy an iPhone next time around? I do. I think that people came away from this event feeling really positive about Huntsville, about Open Huntsville, and about Apple, and that the ripple effect of that, whether immediate or over time, will be very positive for Apple. Just by the law averages, with eight side projects, some are bound to fail. One that I was directly involved in was an app called Frontier. We had this idea to build an app that basically was a mobile app that would show users resources nearby. So restaurants, gas stations, public parks, public Wi-Fi, public parking, that kind of stuff in a mobile app. During the early stages, the Frontier front-end was getting pretty heavily developed. There were wire diagrams, user stories, design documents, and even buy-in from the city. However, it still collapsed. In the process of leading that project, we brought on far too many collaborators. We had you know, upwards of 30 people. How many you think were actual developers? There were probably about five people. The software project had 30 people working on it, but only five with software development skills. If this seems like a bad arrangement, you're correct. But it got worse. It was an entirely different set of non-developers each week. What made me predict ultimate failure is when you would go up there and you would explain what Frontier is, what our goal is, what are the tasks, here's what we've done, and then the very next week, you'd repeat that whole speech again, 
next week, repeat the whole speech again. And then by the time work began, it was two hours. We had another hour I could spend on it. Right. We kept on repeating for the begin for the new people who would come in and find this group for the first time, you know, the startup story and the vision and all that stuff. And it was an it was an enormous time sink. There is a time honored solution to dealing with a project with a lot of unneeded staff. I asked the question to Chris. How do you fire a volunteer? Because that was the solution I came up with. Maybe you need to fire a bunch of people. And I don't know how to go about firing a volunteer. Right. I think that's extremely difficult. And my way of going about it, if I were ever to do it, would be to try to explain in as non-confrontational language as possible the reasons for why a team needs to be smaller and not put the fault of letting someone go on them as if they did something wrong, unless they actually did do something wrong. So we actually had this scenario actually. In the throes of working on Open Huntsville, a, a guy who had come to Hack Night a few times and had expressed an interest in working on a community project said, hey, I'd like to learn about Open Huntsville, can I get involved? And this was in the early days of working on Open Huntsville, and I said, sure, you can get involved, and I invited him to our Slack channel, and I announced to the team, hey, this is this person, he's going to join us, he has these skills, and he'd be a great fit for our team. And he introduced himself, and he said, hey, what is Open Huntsville all about? And we started to do the frontier thing again, where we were going back to square right, one right. and explaining to this guy everything that we had done. And then I had a private talk with Andrew about this, and we agreed that it wasn't the right time to bring this person in. And so I called this person on the phone and said, hey, I'm really sorry. I made a mistake. I shouldn't have brought you into this project. It has nothing to do with you. We need to uninclude you for now. Did he take it well? He did take it well. He was okay. mature about it. And I tried really hard to, to frame that conversation as with... As much with myself taking as much responsibility as possible and with him not getting the sense that he did anything wrong. The effort on Frontier predated Open Huntsville. Yeah. Where, did you take lessons you learned from your failure on Frontier? And Definitely. Apply? Yeah. Okay. So, so what did you learn? Well, I learned that a productive team working on a startup really needs to be limited to three to five people and that everybody on a team needs to have defined roles and responsibilities and there needs to be a good product management plan insofar as a roadmap and tasks broken out and responsibilities assigned and furthermore everyone on the project needs to feel like they are a contributor and that's really one of the the testaments to Open Huntsville's success is that everyone in their defined roles was able to create and add value without anyone telling them that their direction was wrong or that they did a bad job. And I think that lended to the product success. Before coming to Huntsville, Chris spent 25 years in Boston. I asked him how he got here and what motivates him to support the city. So in 2010, I started a tech startup called Grapevine Logic. And that company was, and still is today, an advertising platform that allows consumer brands to work directly with popular YouTube influencers to do product placement. So for example, if Nike has a new pair of shoes, they could put that pair of shoes on a really popular YouTube star as a way of marketing that new product. So when I started that company, my co-founder and I went from having day jobs and not knowing anything about startups to working in a Starbucks pretty much every night and weekend to quitting our jobs and working full-time in a co-working space. Was this another one of your volunteer side gigs that just suddenly turned commercial? Was this no. commercial from the get-go? This was commercial from the get-go. Okay. Yeah. And so in Boston, we worked out of a co-working space called the Cambridge Innovation Center. And this building in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right near MIT, 
is a 14-story co-working center where you have young entrepreneurs on almost every floor with unlimited free food in kitchens on every floor and tons of 25-year-olds riding the elevators and working on myriad different projects. It was kind of the land of milk and honey for people in their 20s working on tech projects. And in that world, people move very fast and they're very focused and there's a lot of money from you know angel investors and venture capitalists coming through those doors and there's a lot of people competing with each other to you know demonstrate their productivity and be successful with their startups and that kind of thing and in the years after I ended up leaving my company joining another startup and then later consulting with other startups I went through an incubator program I worked with a bunch of startups in different settings and met a whole bunch of people focused around startups and entrepreneurship and lived a very fast-paced, work on lots of side projects kind of life. And so that mentality that I have now here in Huntsville was born in Boston. So 2010 to 2015 has really been the birth of my startup-ness. So that was pretty much... The, your 20s and then yeah my 20s so I'm 31 now so when I, I started I started my company when I was 25 26 maybe okay so what brought you to Huntsville so r- originally it was a job at curse I was a product manager at curse for their YouTube product were you hired out of grapevine I wasn't so I left grapevine we before grapevine raised funds and became a bigger company, we were not making much money and I ran out of money and left the company. I needed to go get a regular day job. So I went and got a salary job and my co-founder continued running the company. And he's since raised venture capital and hired a big team and they're doing great. Do you have odd feelings about his success and you leaving? I don't. He's done a great job. It's really great to see the company succeed. And I own a piece of it, which is... Okay, so you, it wasn't a full exit. No, not a full exit. Okay. Chris participates in a lot of entrepreneurial activities, though none actually generate any money. Grapevine Logic was his Boston venture. What about making money in Huntsville? I'm wondering, with all these side projects that you work on, I assume that you charge your dilithium crystals with some mechanism. This is true, yeah. So I just won a, <laughs> I won a bid on a web design project today. Oh, so you're contracting? I'm contracting. Okay, well, yeah. congratulations. So ideally what I do in my life is spend as little time mm-hmm. working for money as possible and make as, not, as much money as I need to pay my bills and live my life and spend all the rest of the time working on community projects. I asked Chris about his plans for the future. He plans to build on top of the success of Open Huntsville. Here is his vision. So Open Huntsville started as an idea for a small time community website that would list the freelancers or consultants in town and has grown into a vision for a community platform that far exceeds the website. And exceeds the website? Yeah. But the but it's open Huntsville. How does so you're exceeding beyond Huntsville in open Huntsville. How does that work? Not necessarily exceeding beyond Huntsville, but leaving the digital realm of the website to and entering the, the physical realm of people meeting and working with each other oh, okay. in real life. So open Huntsville is no longer just a website it's more of a brand that you're taking off of a website and sprinkling everywhere right so there's still a lot of thoughts on this front and we're still figuring it out open huntsville is becoming a brand and under that brand we hope to facilitate or foster other people doing kind of like what we did for open huntsville the website which is form small project teams and implement a project management strategy and have a project manager and launch communities, you know, websites or projects or startups, that kind of thing, in like a project setting. So is this project sort of like Frontier that 
failed, but hopefully they won't fail because um, the it's kind of like Frontier, but with a lot more structure and with multiple parties working on multiple projects. So, are you guiding projects with Open Huntsville? Yes. the The plan is to to facilitate structured collaboration. Is everybody still a volunteer? Everyone from the Open Huntsville team is volunteering and not getting paid. And anyone who would work on projects have their choice in what kind of project they want to work on. If we can be the impetus or inspiration for folks to start a for-profit company or startup, then that's great. We would like to just see more people working on side projects and startups in Huntsville. Big thanks to Chris Beeman for being our guest. You can reach him at chrisbeeman.com and follow him on Twitter at CGBeeman. On to the audio essay. This is an experimental part of the show. I hope you enjoy it. My phone is broken! I have a question. What is the difference between the Java and the JavaScript programming languages? How are they the same? The answer to how are they different could be summarized as too many differences to list. So let's leave that there. If your answer to how are they the same was anything beyond the first four letters in their names, give yourself a gold star. Other acceptable answers could be they both use angle brackets. They are both trademarked by Oracle. Or they share some common keywords. All of those would have been acceptable answers. JavaScript is a very unfortunate name. It is a plague foisted upon developers purely to piggyback off the rising hype of Java back in the 90s. Forevermore, because of the popularity of both Java and JavaScript, developers everywhere will have to either bite their tongue or dive into a pedantic monologue, similar to this one, that both annoys and bores everybody else at meetings. Frankly, there is just no solution in sight. But Mozilla, the foundation that inherited Netscape, the inventors of JavaScript, has certainly tried. Their official, untrademarked name, the name submitted to international standards, is called ECMAScript. That's spelled E-C-M-A script. However, try putting ECMAScript on a resume and see how far it goes. For what it is worth, I looked hard and I could not find an occurrence of Oracle taken to somebody court for referring to their ECMAScript implementation as JavaScript. The trademark may be diluted enough for public use. This may be why Microsoft has stopped pushing JScript. JScript is their implementation of ECMAScript and their workaround of the trademark problem. But how to answer the original Java JavaScript differences question without the conversation going off into the weeds. Here's my take. Java is a compiled language that is mostly used by phones and servers. JavaScript is an interpreted language that is used by web browsers. Despite having similar sounding names, the tech is extremely different. I think that is enough to satisfy the non-developer, and now they have enough ammo to Google for more complete answer. So 20 years have passed since this horrible programming name. Even the inventor of JavaScript said it was a bad idea. It may be too late to backtrack, but we can learn from our mistakes. Naming names should have improved a lot by now, right? Well, JavaScript may be a bad name, but it doesn't go as far as hindering jobs. Arguably, Worse names prevent actual work from happening. Here are some other bad programming language names. I'll call these the unsearchables. In some form or another, the name choice hinders finding help on the language. There are many I could choose, such as any hobby language named after a single letter. But I am focusing my choices on big companies heavily involved in the internet and thus should know better. I'm also sticking to recent languages invented in our post-Google world. For example, Python is not that great of a programming language name, 
but it was invented in the 80s. So here they are. Visualize trying to search for help in documentation. I'm starting from bad to worst. These are Rust, a general purpose compiled language. Swift, the new iOS platform language. Hack, an optimized derivative of PHP. And Go, another general purpose compiled language. The corporate sponsors for these languages are Mozilla, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Let's go through each one. First, Mozilla. Why is Rust a bad language name? Choosing a somewhat common name for the programming language is not necessarily bad. For example, I did not put Google's Dart language on this list. Googling help on playing darts probably does not happen often, and if it did happen, the word would probably be written plural. No, the problem with solving problems with Rust is that Rust is often a problem people are trying to solve. Do a search for Rust help and see what you find. Do we have a plumbing problem? Or is your Rust syntax wrong? For Apple, the language Swift simply collides far too frequently with Taylor Swift. Maybe that is not Apple's fault, but the language was first released in June 2014. Taylor Swift, already a megastar, dropped her best-selling album ever just four months later after Swift was released. Maybe in 10 years, Swift programming help will be easier to Google. Of course, maybe in 10 years, Taylor Swift will still be making albums. You wouldn't want to name your programming language Madonna, would you? For now, in the foreseeable future, it seems we'll have to keep adding minus Taylor to our search queries. I really feel for the poor developer that needs to implement a Taylor series in iOS. For Facebook's hack language, the sheer impossibility to search for help is obvious. Go to Google and query for Facebook hack. Actually, maybe Facebook is operating on three degrees of cleverness by choosing that name. Everybody that wants to actually hack Facebook will not have their results polluted by programming language help, thus making it difficult to actually hack Facebook. Fascinating strategy for Facebook. Still, it doesn't help us poor developers. Google's Go language name is simply absurd. Where to start? How about the Wikipedia disambiguation page for Go is almost five pages long. Go is a verb. Go is an ancient Chinese board game. And on and on and on. How did this name get approved? One of the publicly stated reasons is because it is short and easy to type. That is true. But, I have my own completely fabricated and unfounded speculation. My theory is that a Google marketing exec somewhere liked that the first two letters in Google is Go. And he wanted a language that will, quote, move the project forward, unquote. And now, we have a language named Go. This language name is so ambiguous that it is now often called Go Lang. All one word. I'm sure that the true origin story for the name Go is written somewhere, but I find it interesting that Go and Swift oddly have both common meaning and common connotation. I wonder if they came from the same naming consultants. One honorary accolade before moving on. This is not a poorly named language but its name popped up during my research. That programming language is named Brain. Yes, that was a beep. I'm not personally offended by curse words, but I do try to keep the show roughly PG. This programming language is actually exceptionally named. The name is completely unambiguous and easy to search. Also, as the name implies, the entire language is satire. Also, as having a curse word in the name would apply, 
the language is unsuitable for practical use. I'd argue brain a language that is written entirely with white space is the perfect name for this language. There are lots of satire programming languages. Assuming you have heard of this name, can you name any others? I also have to give kudos to a company whose omission for my essay speaks well of them. Microsoft manages a pile of programming languages under the .NET umbrella. When thinking of bad names in it, it's tempting to pick on C Sharp. But I'd argue C Sharp would not collide much with music searches. Musicians would probably add the word chord in their parameters, and there's just very little to say about a plain single note. The language Boo is also inside .NET. That is indeed a pretty bad name, but Microsoft didn't pick it. They inherited it. If I had to call out something, I think the name .NET itself is the biggest offender, particularly since there was already a magazine spelled .NET focused on web development. Net Magazine existed before the .NET framework, and that magazine only just recently dropped the dot from its name due to the confusion. However, I'm still leaving .NET off this list. Our work is not impeded by this. So dear huge multi-billion dollar technology companies, please make your products easy to search and make them easy to differentiate. The less time we need to spend crafting the perfect search query, the more time we can spend inside your IDE being productive. And that's our show. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like the show, please post a review on iTunes. It helps others find it. You may also send feedback to feedback at mycodeisbroken.com. Thanks again. Until next time, I'm Dan Nagel, signing off. <laughs>